All right, so I think we'll get started. Um, just as uh, attendees trickle in, um, just a reminder that the chat function will be turned off during the talk and that if you have questions, um, you should enter them into the Q&A. Uh, we'll have a short Q&A after the talk, which will be about 45 minutes. Um, so please uh, send any of your questions using the Q&A function and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, all right. So I think we'll get started. Um, this talk is also being recorded and it will be available on the Yale African Studies website. Um, so you can find a, a recording of the talk there. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome and introduce today's speaker. Uh, who also happens to be a mentor and a dear friend, Dr. Sheikh Cham. Dr. Cham is currently the Academic Dean of the School for International Training. Previously, he was Associate Professor of African American Studies, African Studies, and French at The Ohio State University. He served as the editor of Research in African Literatures, the premier journal of African Literary Studies, and of the African Studies Review, the Journal of the African Studies Association. Dr. Chem's research explores the ways in which epistemologies from the so-called global South engage with colonial and post-colonial intellectual traditions, question anti-Black racism in philosophy and literature, as well as cultural and area studies, and shape Pan-African conceptions of ontology and identity. One of the leading voices in Sangora studies and in Negritude studies, Chem has published numerous articles on these topics in leading journals of African studies and French studies. He also edited a special issue of the Journal of African Philosophy on Negritude in 2015, entitled Negritude Reloaded. His first book, Return to the Kingdom of Childhood, Re-Envisioning the Legacy and Re Philosophical Relevance of Negritude, published by Ohio State University Press in 2014, was the first book-length study of Sangorian philosophy. In Return to the Kingdom of Childhood, Chem argues that a careful rereading of Negritude especially with attention to Sarah and Dogon conceptions of time as duration, allows us to better appreciate Sangor's Africa-centered understanding of epistemology and ontology and to recognize Sangorian negritude as a post-colonial philosophy that stands on its own. A comparativist by training, Chem's scholarship is deeply transdisciplinary, using approaches from philosophy, literary analysis, and anthropology. His second monograph, Epistemologies from the Global South, Negritude, Modernity, and the Idea of Africa, will explore the ways in which a decolonial understanding of negritude clarifies and expands more or less pivotal interventions in Africana studies that have developed in contradistinction to negritude, namely Edouard Glissant's Poetics of Relations, Anna Mabancou's conception of a more inclusive French Republic, and the topic of his talk today, Paul Gilroy's Black Atlantic. Dr. Chem's talk this afternoon um, is entitled Negritude, the Black Atlantic and Spectres of Coloniality, an Africa-centered take on Gilroy's uncompleted argument. Um, so with that, uh, please help me welcome Dr. Sheikh Cham, um, and I'll sort of let you go ahead and turn my video off. All right. Thanks, Doyle, uh, for this really, for these kind words. Uh, and um, it's an honor. To, to be here today. And thank you uh, to the Yale Council of African Studies for inviting me uh, to join you here today. And thanks all of you uh, who attended this talk. Uh, this talk is part of a bigger uh, series, a bigger project uh, that I have. Uh, but, and that project is inscribed in my intellectual interest. Uh, for the past 20 years, I would say at least um, 18 years, uh, I, th there's a question that has been at the center of my intellectual engagement. Uh, and the question is, how did we get to have such an ambivalent relation to the philosophy of negritude, uh, presenting it on the one hand as one of the very foundations uh, of African and Caribbean studies, and on the other, as a simplistic anti-racism, racist racism uh, that has run its course and that does not merit anymore our intellectual attention. Uh, so I have attempted 
to um, uh, to try to trace to see really what is what where that ambivalence comes from. And um, my argument is that it comes from the fact that African studies is dominated by Anglophones, uh, but almost, but Senghor has not been translated in English, at least Senghor's philosophical work. And Senghor is the very, uh, the major theoretician of bigotry, but his philosophical work has not been translated by, in, in English. So what I'm trying to do in this pr big project is to do a hermeneutics of Senghor, or, Senghor's philosophy of negritude in light of pivotal moments uh, in the disciplines or what uh, Gilroy would call signposts, right? Uh, and, and in order to show that it remains important and relevant today. So reading it along with Gilroy's Black Atlantic shows not only how relevant uh, Senghor's philosophy is, it also enables me or us to better tackle Gilroy's philosophy. So Paul Gilroy's The Black Atlantic, uh, Modernity and Double Consciousness, was undoubtedly one of the most influential editions in the discipline of Africana studies in the 20th, 20th century. It is particularly important, not only because of its strong critique of the limits of, the West, of Western modernity, but also, and more importantly, as a powerful critique of the language of occultic cultural insiderism, that black nationalisms, including both the latent one in, in black post-structuralist literary criticism and the manifest one in Afrocentricity used to justify their assertions and to conceal the fact that the exclusive ethnic space is never the primary category of identification for black thinkers. So Gilroy condemns accordingly what he perceives as the epistemic foundation of the Afrocentered tradition. That is, its tendency to simplify and essentialize the otherwise multifaceted and modern manifestation of, new, of what he calls new world black cultures. So as opposed to the cultural insiderism of this Afrocentered tradition, Gilroy invites us to investigate the ways the Atlantic underpins the fundamentally modern hybrid and fluid Black Atlantic. Uh, so in, in this perspective, uh, Gilroy's perspective is important today, uh, he claims, because even if African, and I quote, even if African linguistic tropes and political and philosophical themes are still visible for those who wish to see them, they have often been transformed and adapted by their new world locations to a new point where the dangerous issues of purified essences and simple origins lose all meanings." End quote. Gilroy's projects can thus be read as a critique of an Afrocentered theology that considers Africa as a driving force behind contemporary diasporic Black cultures and a call to complexify the functions conditions and intellectual productions of people of African descent in the new world. He proposes, Gilroy proposes in turn, a method that claims to free the discipline of Africana studies from the dictatorship of modern teleology and its corollary, the understanding of African descended people as subjects in modernity rather than subjects of modernity. So in this sense, Gilroy is interesting for us, not only because he questions the, 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 the traditional modern understanding and teleology, understanding of the world based on a certain teleology of progress, but also the tradition of Africana studies that has essentialized blackness and therefore replicated or reiterated the very problem uh, that, that is the problem of modernity. That is, the, and its very foundation, the teleology of progress and its cor corollary, the, the essentialization of races. I argue that Gilroy's representation of the Black Atlantic is, however, an incomplete argument, as he fails to offer the condition for a radical theory of liberation unhinged to the pervasive Hegelian dialectic and the Eurocentric universal, universal paradigm. In fact, Gilroy's critique of modern, modern teleology is still teleological. Reading Gilroy's teleological understanding of Black Atlantic cultures in light of Senghor's philosophy, however, creates the possibility to reconsider 
the present conditions of people of African descent beyond the limits of the Eurocentric paradigm as it completes the Black Atlantic scholar's argument by placing it outside of the binary log logic that he is, despite all his claims, unable to access. So what I'm going to do is trace um, Gilroy's critique of Pan-Africanism, then look at the limits of that critique, uh, which I call the specters of colonialities. So although Gilroy questions uh, the, the teleology that essentializes races and hierarchizes them and, and limits the possibility of understanding the pluriversality of, of modernity, I argue that he falls within the same teleology, teleology. And ultimately, I will see how reading Gilroy in light of Senghor can complete the argument. So I'm going to focus mostly on Gilroy's critique of Pan-Africanism. The critique of Pan-Africanism and Black nationalism, so not just Gilroy's critique of Pan-Africanism, but an Afri Africa-centered uh, engagement uh, with, um, uh, with, with, with knowledge and knowledge production. Uh, so the critique of Pan-Africanism and Black nationalism that Gilroy develops in the Black Atlantic is rooted in his critique of the paradox constitutive of the traditional conception and representation of modernity. Gilroy suggests that any critique of the representation of people of African descent in the modern world is possible only if it seriously rejects the understanding of the modern telos that lead to the invention of a single world history. Such critique will set the possibilities to show, as stated, that new world blacks had not, at a certain moment, been added to a white modern world that sprung from the tie of Jupiter. They are rather constitutive of it. In other words, racism and the traditional representations, functions, and treatments of African descended peoples in the modern world are not the real problems here. Uh, they are the effects of the veritable problem, the conditions of existence and legitimation of the traditional conception of modernity and the universal modern subject rooted in a single history of progress that has imagined itself in opposition to a subliminal, but not less invented, not non-European other. These conditions are for the Black British scholar, the philosophical foundation of the universalist and racist conception of modernity that unfortunately, that unfortunately the binary position of Pan-African and Black nationalist traditions have not been able to grasp. For Gilroy, Although Afri-centered scholars attempt to offer a counter-argument to the modern Eurocentric understanding of the world, the essentialist and racist modern chronotypes that constitutes the condition of possibility of white supremacy function also, and paradoxically, as the very foundation of their discourse. While the modern teleology imagines the pre-modern era as a primitive moment of loss, that tends to develop as time progresses towards the end of history, the Afri-centered and Black nationalist traditions creates for Gilroy a pre-colonial image of the Garden of Eden, disturbed by a colonial presence of loss and evolving towards a future of felicity at the end of history. So in this Black uh, nationalist tradition, we see the same telos, the same modern paradigm. And in this sense, despite the difference in their appreciation of people of African descent's presence, the teleology constitutive of the white supremacist understanding of world history and its effects, the understanding of the world as following a linear sense of history remains exactly the same. As Gilroy says in the Afrocentered tradition, the anteriority of African civilization to Western civilization is asserted not in order to escape the linear time, but in order to claim it and thus subordinate its narrative of civilization to a different set of political interests without even attempting to change the terms themselves. In other words, these Africa-centered philosophers are, for Gilroy, a black way of being white. This logic is bound, Gilroy tells us, to reinvent an absolutist conception of ethnic difference that is prioritized over other manifestations of being. 
The way out of the Afrocentric conundrum, Gilroy argues, is to consider seriously and carefully the significance of routes, flows, exchanges, and in between elements that call the very desire to be centered into question. It is therefore necessary to problematize the teleological conception of modern historicity in order to grasp the complexity of the rhizomorphic fractal structure of the transcultural international formation that he calls the Black Atlantic. As opposed to the Afrocentered movement, which appears to rely upon a linear idea of time that is enclosed at each end of the grand narrative of African advancement, Gilroy proposes a theory of, diverse, of pluriversality. The necessity to focus on routes rather than routes leads, lo leads him logically to understand, leads logically to Gilroy's understanding of the ship as the chronotop that allows him to think of the new world black beyond the simple space of time and time of modern European historicity. Gilroy's metaphor of the ship as the symbol of modern black cultures in, is undoubtedly uh, ground, groundbreaking. Yet, as much as Gilroy reclaims the importance of people of African descent in the formation of a hybrid modernity, the importance of Africa and African discursive practices and social political particularities are, if not completely ignored, at least seriously downplayed in Gilroy's theory of modernity. In fact, Gilroy's theory of a counterculture of modernity developed in contradistinction uh, with the Afrocentric philosophy is also a theory of the separation of New World Blacks from what he imagines as their African past. While the Atlantic is clearly a bridge that denotes New, new World Blacks participation and belonging to the New World, it is also a natural barrier from their African past. As a matter of fact, Gilroy presents the Middle Passage literally as, I quote, a fundamental break with African realities. And uh, in another instance, quote, the recurring break where time stops and restarts, end quote. The implication of Gilroy's understanding of the Middle Passage as a fundamental break, break is twofold. One, Despite his desire to think of Black cultures as involved in an ongoing process of movement and exchange across the Atlantic, he still imagines them as rooted in a single, albeit plural, point of departure. In this sense, Giroy does not question the linearity of time constitutive of European modernity and Pan-African scholarship as such. He, at best, changes the points and the nature of origin of the modern teleology of progress into a seemingly different theory of heterogeneity or pluriversality, but he still retains the possibility of a beginning of history evolving towards its end. Time can be read in this context as a succession of snapshots that separate a singular African past from a diverse middle past passage present, moving towards a pluriversal Black Atlantic future. Gilroy's conception of the Middle Passage denotes uh, the limits of his theory and his failure to think outside of the possibility of origins and his inability to apply to the African continent an understanding of time as movement that is free from the epistemic shackles of European teleology. Moreover, Gilroy's understanding of the Middle Passage, which marks the disconnection of New World Africans from their pre-modern roots, implies that Africa is located in a past, in a time space that not only precedes that of the origins in which the new Black Atlantic realities are rooted, but that is also fundamentally different from it. One can therefore argue that Gilroy's understanding of the Middle Passage as ultimately a temporal break shows that his theory is an incomplete argument as he does not apply his critique of modernity and the limits of the modern teleology to his own understanding of Africa's presence in the Black Atlantic. Gilroy's work is not flawed now by what he says explicitly 
that is, his critique of the teleology of, Af of a certain Afrocentric paradigm. Rather, it is what he does not say, namely his assumption that Africa had remained outside of modernity and consequently his imagination of a modern black Atlantic that is fundamentally different from a non-modern African past that I find concerning. So now I'm gonna to move toward the second part uh, of, of, of this presentation to talk a little bit about the specters of coloniality in uh, Gilroy's uh, argument. So I want to move further to show how Gilroy's understanding of the middle passage now seriously limits the possibilities of understanding black consciousness and engaging and the possibilities of course of engaging with black liberation. It is true that Gilroy gives an interesting and radical reading of the history of black resistance and presence in modernity, as he reminds, through a reading of Frederick Douglass stories, the constant history of resistance. So he reminds us of the constant history of resistance and agency that constitutes the foundation of black presence in modernity. This is what Gilroy calls, one of these instances, uh, Gilroy calls the turn towards death based on the conception of death as agency, in which Black Atlantic subjects embrace death as a source of power that defies Western thinking. In this logic, death is, death is not a measure of despair or a consecration of lust. It is rather a radical ontological tool and an intrinsic negation of the pervasiveness of coloniality that promises the consecration of Black agency. And here I'm referring to, 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 diff, to, um, to, to Gilroy's understanding of what he calls the, 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 the turn towards death, which is the action that we've seen in the history of slavery when people of African decide, de descent have decided to embrace death for freedom. And Gilroy thinks about this in relation to, the, to Hegel's dialectic of the mass of the slave in order to show that the beginning and the involvement of black presence in the new world is completely linked to this tendency and this engagement to fight for their lives. So when the bondsman fights the master in order to claim their humanity. And my argument is that continuing to think within the modern, uh, the modern paradigm of master and bondsman is in itself limiting one need to think completely differently. And that is precisely why what I will show later Senghor will, um, uh, will, 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 will show. Uh, staying within the Western paradigm limits the possibilities of uh, liberation. Gilroy's understanding of people of African descent's presence in the new world that leads to his theory of the turn towards death is founding is founded on a particular reading of modern black subjectivity from the perspective of the Hegelian dialectic of the master and the bondsman that we can understand better if we consider it in light of Fanon's reading uh, and use of the Hegelian dialectic. Fanon has an interesting take on Hegel's dialectic of the master and the bondsman. The latter's reflection on the figure of consciousness corresponding to the phenomena of domination and servitude. The book, uh, the, phenom the, the, phenomenology, the Phenomenology of Spirit, Omar Ja, uh, a colleague from, a, from a University of Shahantejo, uh, reminds us, is to be read as a propagatic to his science of, to, to, Giro, to um, uh, Hegel's science of logic. It is an essential moment of Hegel's phenomenology that is the path taken by consciousness to gain access to truth, to science. Hegel's path to truth and consciousness have three major moments. The first one is the moment of the primacy of the object. The second moment corresponds to the primacy of the subject over the object. And finally, the third moment, or reason subdivided into subjective reason, is that, of, this, is that of coincidence between subject and object. It is in the second moment that Fanon finds the tools to develop his theory of liberation. For Hegel, during this second moment, after the subject's dissatisfaction of being recognized on the basis of the, of the physical order, 
comes the realization that only does a consciousness develop self-consciousness through the consciousness of the other, but also one self-consciousness requires that the other acknowledges it. When two consciousnesses meet for the first time, they engage, given their desire for acknowledgement, in a struggle for recognition. During this struggle, and this is what's interesting for the history of Black, uh, of, of, of black liberation theory. So during this struggle between the, 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 the two um, subjects, the consciousness that is the keenest to lose their life for recognition will prevail and submit the other consciousness into slavery. The slave is brought into slavery precisely because they are not ready to sacrifice their lives. They are, in the Hegelian logic, a victim of their own lack of self-determination. Of course, Hegel um, goes on to show how ultimately the slave gets free uh, either uh, through, through work or um, at the end, uh, the, the experience of death itself allows the, the, the subject to, 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 to find um, its own uh, self. And, and therefore become free. But that's not really what, what, what matters here. What, what matters for us really is the second moment uh, of the struggle uh, between the master of the, and the slave. And this is what matters for the history of Black, black studies. Uh, I use this opportunity to acknowledge a friend of mine uh, and a good colleague, uh, Adi Ba, um, uh, who has clarified some of these concepts uh, for the literary person who plays with philosophical concepts that I am. Uh, but here, in, a, in an incisive and particularly careful reading of the possible uh, political application of the dialectic of the master and advancement, Umar Dja, a colleague, uh, a colleague, as I said before, of the University of Chakantajok, reminded his reader that Koja did not just popularize Hegel's reflection on dominance and servitude as the dialectic of the master of the slave. Koja also, I quote, disinserted the dialectic of the master and the, and the slave of the phenomenological process by making it a moment independent of the rest of the Hegelian narrative. It is by conferring it, by conferring on the dialectic of master and slave, the most adequate form possible for its mobilization in the service of theories of emancipation and liberation. It is therefore on the logical that Funnel, like Gilroy and many other Black thinkers, use Hegel's framework, as presented by Kocher, to develop their own theory of liberation in the particular colonial instance. Yet, and this is very important, as opposed to Gilroy, Funnel understands that the possible freedom of the enslaved is impossible within the modern colonial realm. The action of dismantling coloniality is the condition of possibility of liberation. In the colonial context, founded on the dehumanization of the colonized through the humanization of the colonizer, an abstract, an abstraction with one's consciousness, the action of transformation of reality through work, or even a possible face-to-face -face with the master are not enough to reach liberation. In the colonial system, the very essence of that structure precludes any possibility of consciousness and abstraction. Thus, for Funnel, a violent cleaning struggle that will turn the entire system on its head is the precondition for the liberation of the African bondsman. In other words, what is interesting is that this history of Black liberation theories continue to follow uh, work with Hegel's uh, dialectic of the master of the slave, rather than going beyond. What is interesting with Fanon, however, is that although he works within the same paradigm, he acknowledges that the beginning of liberation can, 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 will happen only after the entire structure is destroyed. And that's not what we see with Gilroy's theory. Read from the perspective of Gilroy's Hegelian logic that can only imagine contemporary modern black subjects acts of self-destruction inside the historical normativity instituted by slavery is bound to fail because the celebrated turn towards death did simply not happen for most of us. If that turn to death is what really would lead us to freedom, 
And if it didn't happen historically, because we know how most histories of, um, uh, of, of decolonization happen, then are we bound to be nothing but ex-slaves or ex-colonized whose humanity are whose humanities are at best based on the master's benevolence. The reading of the encounter. So, so basically what I'm asking for here is that the only way to engage with this dialectic, the only way to engage with the modern black presence in modernity is either a la fanon to completely destroy the system or to go beyond this logic and try to find a different way to understand the encounter between the so-called master and the so-called slave. And that's what Senghor, I think, uh, offers. A reading of the encounter between the white master and the enslaved African beyond the dialectic of the master and the bondsman, and which acknowledges the particularity of the Afrocentered black subjects, offers a different way of thinking of African descended people's presence in modernity. I start from the postulation that the idea of the subject is in the same way is exactly in the same way as the idea of freedom located in particular discursive traditions and practices. In what can be, if we were to imagine uh, the, the encounter of the European master and the African bondsman that led to the transplantation of Africans to the new world, one can argue that the two subjects that enter in conflict have completely different relations to freedom and subjectivity because they come from completely, utterly different social political realities and therefore have completely different conception of subjectivity. Yes, we can imagine the European subject as the subject of modernity. And if the European subject that ultimately takes on the role of the master can very well be read as a Hegelian subject, the African subject with whom they enter in conflict does not yearn for the European subject's recognition precisely because their understanding of subjectivity and freedom are neither based on the Hegelian duality nor on the idea of the modern Cartesian subject. And you know, yes, like from Fanon, you call it um, Du Bois, uh, even Malcolm X, we have focused so much on the Hegelian dialectic. And yet the idea of freedom that the, the African that encounters the, 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 this Western self uh, the, the idea of freedom that they have is fundamentally different. As a matter of fact, the understanding of the concepts of being and freedom that many a Wolof, an Akan, or a Yoruba subject carry is not a function of the desire to be acknowledged by the other's consciousness. Rather, it is based on the understanding of the subject as determined by their membership to a particular kin. In effect, belonging to a kin is, in most African societies, the very foundation of subjectivity. The slave is not the enslaved. The slave in most African cultures is not the one that is captured and enslaved. The slave is the, the, the person who does not have a kin. This is precisely why I argue that as soon as these Africans was captured and put in the Atlantic, they didn't engage in a Hegelian dialectic. What they did was invent Africa. So the Yoruba, the Wolof, the Akan became African for the first time and created this new imagined community that they called the home. Accordingly, enslaved Africans understood that the struggle for emancipation was not necessarily based on a direct, on a direct or direct standoff that would ultimately lead, as Fanon and Duroy imagined, to the master's recognition of their humanities. Rather, they understood their existence as free subjects, as their abilities to keep their ties with their cultures and their kids. Now I'm going to move to show, you know, I, I, I showed the limits uh, of, um, uh, I, I, I talked about Gilroy's critique of Pan-Africanism. Then I showed the limits of, of this, um, this paradigm rooted, of, of Gilroy's engagement rooted in, in, the, in, in Western modernity and talked about the necessity to think from a fundamentally and decolonial perspective, precisely because the black subject, the enslaved African subject, thinks of freedom and subjectivity in a completely different way. And now I'm gonna show how an engagement with Senghor can create 
possibilities of thinking of black presence in the new world and even modernity from an utterly radically different way. Senghor's philosophy can be read in the same vein as Gilroy's as a theory of a counterculture of modernity. Yet while Gilroy in the in the logic of coloniality, imagine New World's Black experiences as a spatial, a spatial temporal break materialized by the Middle Passage, the, the, the possible decolonial, the, let me call it the Africa center, re-engagement with Gilroy's Black Atlantic in light of the severe dialectic of time and memory that Senghor proposes, makes the discourse on Black modernity more complex. I'm being careful with the word decolonial here. That's why I'm saying Africa Center. It shows beyond the concept of decolonial. It shows beyond the representation of New World Blacks as either members of a heterogene heterogeneous diasporic culture, a la Gilroy, or as lost sons of a nonetheless imagined pre-modern African world, a la, as the Afrocentric scholars would say, that the modern experience of African descended peoples on the continent and abroad are equally manifestation of several shifts constituting the very nature of African histories from the so-called indefinite uh, pre-middle passage, and I put this into quote, spaces and times to now. Senghor's conception of time allows him to question in the same vein as Gilroy's philosophy, the possibility of a return to the roots. And yet he opens along the same line as Afrocentric scholars, the possibilities of envisioning an understanding of blackness that is inseparable from a more or less essentialist theory of African particularities. In this sense, Senghor's essentialism, I call it an essentialism of, well, I, I take this from, uh, from another text by, by Suleiman Bashir Jain. Um, so Senghor's essentialism of hybridity avoids, unlike Gilroy's, to throw the baby out with the bathwater by questioning the possibility of new beginnings while acknowledging the importance of the ladders of, 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 of the ladders critique of the latent, la, lat, latent essentialist anti-modernism of the Afrocentric tradition. Senghor's philosophy is based on a particular understanding of time that, unlike Gilroy's, may offer the possibility to fall in the trap of modern teleology and its corollary, the understanding of New World Africans, uh, African, New World African space and time as a break from early manifestations of Africanness. As I show more in detail in Return to the Kingdom of Childhood, my first book, Senghor's conception of time as duration constitutes the epistemic foundation of a theory of the Black subject's presence in modernity. Even though Senghor does not explicitly develop a systematic theory of time, his critique of mechanical, of, of mechanical reason in modern philosophy has enabled to reach the immediate data of consciousness precisely because objectivity tends to fi fix being in space and time and thereby fails to reach the immediate data of life is possible only if it is, as Bergson suggests, founded on the conception of time as duration. This conception of time as, as duration leads Senghor to argue that one can neither separate a supposed pre-colonial past from a mixed hybrid and enfolding presence, nor imagine the possibility of going back in time. There is no reason in consequence to fear acculturation and no need to attempt to retrieve supposed lost African roots. The application of Senghor's conception of time to his understanding of culture and memory shows that even if the diverse Negro cultures, what he calls Negro cultures, African descended cultures today of continental Africa, or that of the diaspora are bound to constantly become other, they remain African in that their presence is inseparable from their past, since the past, present, and future participate in the same movement of becoming. Yet Africa itself is understood as constantly becoming. In this sense, the enslaved African cannot but be at the same time African and modern. Senghor's understanding of time opens the possibility to think of Black experiences in modernity beyond the dichotomous logic between a Pan-Africanist essentialism and a diasporic diversality characteristic of Gilroy's famous claim to occupy the space between the two. As opposed to Gilroy's postulation that Black cultural nationalism necessarily leads to the denial of the hybrid and modern manifestation of the Black Atlantic, Senghor's work shows that a clear subscription to the Afri-centered logic 
does not necessarily lead to a theory of Africanness that does not accept its continuing diversity. He postulates rather that an Afrocentric perspective must also be essentially pro-reversal and constantly becoming since the black subject is ontologically engaged in an enfolding duration. Senghor stand is particularly important for a reading of the contemporary relevance of Leroy's Black Atlantic tradition, as it shows that the latter's conception of diaspora does not necessarily have to be opposed to the Pan-African scholars longing for Africanness. Rather, they are complementary. That is precisely why half a century before Gilroy, who understands the Black Atlantic as a laboratory in which modern cultures are developed, Senghor presents the modern experience of people of African descent as, at worst, another page of African history. Yet, while, Gilroy, while Gilroy's understanding of this moment, marked by the Middle Passage, the institution of slavery, and the continued instances of exchanges in the Atlantic, while, while these fix nonetheless Africa and continental Africa in an imagined space and time that is different from that of those of their Black Atlantic counterparts, Senghor offers the possibility to broaden Gilroy's perspective. He includes, in this engagement with modernity, the old continent, and here I'm referring to Africa and not Europe, in the constant enfolding of modern history, First, because of the literal changes that colonization brings in continental Africa. Second, because of African descent, of African dis descended people, because African descended uh, people had never severe ties with the old continent. And finally, because for Senghor, colonization is in the same vein as the Middle Passage and the institution of the plantation system, a manifestation of coloniality, the instituted system of dehumanization of people of African descent that function as one of the foundations of the darker side of modernity. It is therefore, if we like it or not, equally constitutive of the birth and development of modernity. Colonization is to be understood in Senghor's work as the experience and consequences of the experiences of epistemic and physical oppression, economic and political domination, and social and cultural subjugation that were, that still are, directed at people of African descent, and that have consequently created heterogeneous African cultures from Gore to Barbados, from Baia to the Gulf of Guinea, and from Sudan to Saudi Arabia. In this sense, Africa is not necessarily to be understood as a geographical space, but rather as a concept, the, deterior, the, 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 the deterioratorialization, the deteriorate, all right, you know what I'm saying, the deterior, the deterioratorialization, whatever, the deterioratorialization from which is often less physical than epistemic and psychological. You know, it's all these languages playing in my head right now. The understanding of the diaspora should then not be based just on physical detachment to a mythical African land. While Gilroy's perspective considers implicitly that Africans born on the continent are somehow closer to the pre-middle passage African cultures and tradition than people of African descent who were transplanted during the Middle Passage, the close analysis of these cultures suggests the more complex pictures. I mean, if you go to my neighborhood in Amiche Toa, a fundamentally African neighborhood, you will find a very Creole space. And that's what Africa is in the same way as, uh, maybe not in the same way, but that's what Africa is, as is uh, modern African, uh, new world African spaces. It is worth repeating now um, in conclusion, in these closing notes, uh, that despite Gilroy's innovative work, it's grounding in the European discursive tradition, that of the Hegelian dialectic in particular, reinscribes his logic in the same colonial paradigm that he attempts to question. In fact, Gilroy considers that the modern teleology that leads to a universalization of the provincial white or black subject that has dominated the modern discourse is an anomaly. He argues accordingly 
the possibility of a countercultural alternative to modernity that would keep the values of the latter while opening it to a more diverse genealogy. That is why he attempts to think of the particularity of Black liberation and Black citizenship from the perspective of the modern paradigm, since after all, modernity is a theory of human liber liberation, can be uh, read as uh, a path to human liberation. Yet the hierarchical understanding of the world characteristic of modern, modern, modern European discourses is not an anomaly. It is the very foundation of the modern logic. At least that's my postulation. Understanding history from the teleological conception of time and progress constitutive of modernity cannot but lead to a hierarchy of beings and cultures that is bound to be re replicated in space. This is precisely why the conception of the modern subject cannot be separated from the invention of the other of the European self. In this sense, the contemporary conditions of the formerly enslaved and colonized Africans must be conceptualized outside of the logic that can imagine it, that, that imagines the African presence only as an ex-slave. Gilroy's work could therefore not have thought of Africa differently because it is trapped in the modern paradigm. Senghor offers, fortunately, an alternative philosophy that is at the same time a theory of liberation while it avoids falling into the hierarchical logic that is a consequence of modern teleology. In this sense, Senghor proposes a way out of the limits of Kilroy's aporia. The theoretician of negritude does not propose the possibility to occupy the position of the middle, which leads to a new essentialism, be it uh, a pluriversal one. He offers rather a position that has the capacity to claim both singularity and multiplicity at the same time and in the same space. Senghor's philosophy can therefore be read as a way to complete, to retrospectively complete Gilroy's work as he reclaims the modern experience of people of African descent while avoiding to fall in the trap of imagining the motherland as a continent constrained in a different space and a different time before the modern experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheikh, um, for that talk, which I think really underscores the importance and, and the ongoing relevance of, of Senghor's work, um, not only to complete, as you say, uh, Gilroy's argument, but also to serve as a kind of supplement to, to thinkers like Fennel. Um, so we already have some questions in the chat, um, and I'll just invite you, members of the audience, um, to please put any questions you might have in the Q&A, um, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Uh, so our first question comes from Christopher Miller, who asks about the lack of translations of Senghor. He says, what texts or texts of Senghor's do you think would have, would have had or might have had the greatest impact in the Anglophone world if, it, if only it had been translated timely in a timely and accurate fashion? So this is a, a kind of what if question, like what if Senghor had been available at the time and in good translation? Right, Prof, uh, greetings. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a pleasure to and an honor to have you here uh, with us. Uh, what text? I think uh, it's so many texts, as, as, as you know, Prof. Uh, one, of, one of the limits of um, Africana studies, I think, is that in many instances, uh, from the 1960s to now, uh, major moments in Africana studies have, in one way or another, uh, been engaged with negritude, right? And you name it, you know, uh, all these signposts have engaged with negritude. Um, all major, I, I argue, be it Apia, uh, of course, Modimbe is a francophone and the 1980s turn, uh, we saw for sure. Uh, but even now, uh, the, the, the Africana studies uh, is always a somewhat uh, a, a reflection, a critique often of negritude. Senghor is the major theoretician of negritude. Absolutely no doubt. Negritude is understood today as one of the foundation of what we do. The Black study, well, Franco Africana studies, like one of the philosophical foundations of Africana studies. Yet the five libertés, 
the liberty are somewhat philosophical, political uh, engagements of Senghor with uh, African Africanness. The five liberty have not been translated. So, Prof, pick any uh, most of Senghor's philosophical engagement with negritude have not been translated. Just a couple have. So, so this is one of the biggest gaps. I don't see any gap that's as big as this one in our discipline. And even worse now, beyond the translation, uh, they are out of print. Senghor's major words are actually out of print. Uh, so, so you know, I, I think it is essential uh, to to translate uh, Senghor in general and his engagement from the 1930s to to the to the 90s 1990s. All his texts on negritude, most of his texts uh, on on art, African art, and their implications, which give very sophisticated uh, engagement uh, with them uh, with with Africanness and critique of modernity. Uh, one example is, as I just said, as I as I just showed, uh, how reading Senghor in English could have uh, uh, helped better understand uh, Gilroy. You know, yeah. I hope I understood your question. I don't. It's it's it's. Uh, I would say that Senghor needs to be translated. Uh, the five volumes of Senghor uh, need to be translated from what the black man conveys in the 1930s, 1937 to the 1993 uh, text on the pluriversality of um, Africanness and metisarchy. Great. Um, so our next question. Uh, comes from Baba Karfe. Your concept of kinship in African communities is very interesting and a very powerful counter argument to Gilroy's critique of cultural insiderism. Um, he asks uh, how the ideas of kinship and belonging to a community as fluid um, might be problematized uh, without falling into a Gilroyan decontextualization um, and how might Senghor help us here? Uh, can we, Doyle, can we open the, the mic for a second so that Babaka can explain a little bit more? Sure. Um, I don't know that the audience uh, that they actually have, they can um, unmute themselves. Um, are you able to see the, see the question yourself? Mm -hmm. you, I can read it again too. Yeah, and yeah, let's do that. Sure. Um, so he says your con concept of kinship in African communities I think when you were speaking about yeah. the difference between recognition and, and kinship um, is very interesting and very powerful as a counter argument to Gilroy's critique of cultural insiderism. I'm having a problem to problematize the ideas of kinship and belonging to a community as fluid in the very African context without falling into uh, a Gilroyan decontextualizing kind of cosmopolitan reading of such uh, fluid identities, uh, especially in the African urban setups. Um, so yeah. How could Senghor thinking be helpful here? Right. Um, see, this is what I'm saying, right? That I, I, I go uh, from uh, the understanding uh, that all communities are invented communities. Uh, and um, uh, so they, what is happening at that moment, right? What I'm, what I'm saying, I'm not saying that today, uh, well, let me get back to that. What is happening at the moment of encounter is a fun fundamental question. Who am I as a captured individual? Because let's imagine that the African that is captured, the enslaved African has to ask the fundamental question of their own existence. Traditionally, the history of black studies has thought of this encounter from the perspective of the Hegelian dialectic. And the Hegelian dialectic is definitely linked to the idea of the subject. Who am I as a human being? And who am I is, is, is intrinsically linked to the idea of recognition by the other. Right? So we assume that the African that in the 15th century enters this discussion is asking the same question. But the idea of being in the African context, in many African cultures, is linked to something else. Not to the Cartesian, I think, therefore, I am, but to something that's closer, I would say, to the, the, the more popular today understanding of Ubuntu, right? 
any in Senegal, in for the world of, it's Nietzsche. For most African cultures, it's something. One is defined essentially through one's belonging to a kin. So what happens in the 15th century is, at the moment of enslavement, the Africans, what do they do? They realize that I am a slave only if I lose touch with my kin. And, I, 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 and, and, it, and it seems that the European master understands it as well. As a matter of fact, the first thing that they try to do is change your name, give you new gods, and um, uh, stop you from speaking your language. But the Africans, what they do, at that point they're not African, yet yeah, they're Yoruba, they're, uh, they're Wolof, they're Zulu, they're Akan, they're other things. But the first thing that they do, they create something that didn't even exist before, which is Africa. They turn around, I imagine them metaphorically on the boat, turning around and saying the place where we all come from, although we seem to be all different, is a place that does exist. And that community is still here. Here we are and that community is called Africa. And as long as that community exists, I cannot be a slave. As a matter of fact, they also start creating in the new world, all these new myths, again, all, uh, communities are invented communities, right? The myth that when you die, your body is taken back to Africa, to Guinea. You find those myths in the south of the United States, in Haiti, in many other places. So what I'm saying is that if we start to think of the idea of ontology from that perspective, then two things happen. We do not function within the limits of the Western paradigm when we think of freedom, it's fun. And two, we realize that Africans have never been slaves. They have been enslaved. Up to the end. And even Africa now, and that, that can lead us to, to another question. What is Africa? How does it function and stuff? Now, can we use that? Uh, does that work today? Uh, as, as, as we think of cosmopolitanism, uh, I'm not, probably not. Uh, uh, but I also, I'm not sure is the Afri if the African is fundamentally cosmopolitan as well, you know. Uh, um, just before we move to the next question, could I ask um, mm -hmm. kind of a follow-up on that, which um, you mentioned sort of the rupture um, with kinship, but also language. And I, I, I think one of, uh, Sangor's uh, strengths is that he's so attentive to Wolof and Serer and Pular and, you know, other African languages in, in contrast to Gilroy. Um, and how does that sort of affect um, Gilroy's argument, do you think? Do you think that's connected to his understanding of his sort of epistemological assumptions? Uh, the, 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 the... Well, that's, that's, a very, that's a very interesting um, question, question, Doyle. Uh, what it shows, and again, let me, let me just say this right before I start, right? Uh, in my engagement with Senghor, the question that I often say is, what could Senghor, I use the, the, the future anterior, right? Uh, what could Senghor have said? Because I think Senghor also at times, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, like there's, there's been since the 1940s, there's been a lot of critiques that show the limits of Senghor, right? And Senghor is often confused. You know, Senghor, no doubt about it. But despite that confusion, I, I think Senghor is so rooted in African cultures that um, when you read him closely, you see that really Africa-centered perspective. And in that African-centered perspective, you definitely see a moment when engagement with African languages, something that most people don't know is that Senghor was a linguist. We know that he was a grammarian, but Senghor was writing his PhD in linguistics, African language, languages that he never finished, right? And he understands in many aspects, in, 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 um, uh, and he talks about in many uh, parts of his, his work, how thinking is inseparable from that, that we do dwell in language and we think through language and the importance of speaking African languages in order to engage with the world a certain way. But that engagement with African languages never leads in Senghor to a sort of essentialism. 
All right. So, and, and to, to tie this to Babaka's question, and in Senghor, I don't see necessarily cosmopolitanism as, as different from that which is not cosmopolitanism, but there is definitely a, at any moment, uh, mixtures and diversality and um, pluriversality in Senghor, from the beginning to the end. You know, the idea of cosmopolitanism, imagine those who are not and those who are too, uh, provincial to be cosmopolitan. But in Senghor, from the beginning to the end, there is this um, pluriversality. But now, within the question of language, this pluriversality is inseparable from rootedness. But the rootedness in itself, and here I, I want to use um, a, a, a glisson, but Senghor's rootedness is very, very similar. Uh, to, to Glissant's uh, rhizomes in many instances. And I, I talk about that in, in other instances. And yes, now to, to, to make it quick, in that sense, we can see how Gilroy imagined the possibility of an Africa that's detached from this new cosmopolitan, uh, uh, new world blackness, right? But in Stengor, these pluriversalities are everywhere and from the beginning. You know, when Senghor says we should be mixed, à la fin, que, que um, chacun doit être métis à sa façon, everybody should be mixed in their own way. And that which traditionally has been presented as something that happens at the end of history is again based on the fact that we didn't read Senghor very carefully, or we didn't have access because Senghor for Senghor, mixture goes back to the beginning. There's never a moment when Africa was rooted in a single history. Um, so our, our next question uh, actually brings us to Glissant. Um, so the audience member asked what Fanon considers as the Antillian and is echoed by Glissant in his Antianité depends upon the authority of the colonial space and colonization of cognition for the rupture between the Black Atlantic and the continent. Um, what might an engagement with Senghor's work uh, clarify um, regarding the limits of colonial power? I think what Senghor's work uh, clarifies within the limits of um, uh, the colonial power uh, is uh, the the what. That's why you know earlier I was I was I was careful of using the the, the concept of decoloniality because in Senghor's work, what we see really is the limits of the pervasiveness of coloniality. Senghor assumes that there has always been spaces of development of alternative knowledges. Senghor also acknowledges and accepts and does not necessarily reject knowledge that may come from somewhere else, as long as they are not rooted in a certain teleology and a hierarchization of races. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and the idea and, and Senghor's understanding of metissage is more linked to Glissant's understanding of creolization than Antianite per se. Because Senghor's metissage goes through the, the acknowledgement that he says, we are not, say, look, we've been, we've been in contact with uh, the West for 300 years and we have not chosen. He also adds, look, we are human beings and human beings are not machines. We wish. It, if, if there was a possibility of forgetting, then yes. But as human being and time, past, present and future, and, and future being inseparable as the human is unfolding in time and duration, then being cannot be separated. And pluriversality is the essence of who we are. And by the way, that's not Senghor. That's African cultures in general. And I argue often that that's why we were <laughs> colonized. Because fundamentally pluriversal. Interestingly, today, if you go uh, to to our to to any African space, what is interesting is it is very likely for an older person, eighty year old, to speak four or five languages than for a younger person to do so. The very uh, uh, essence of Africanness implies diversity. And I think this is what's interesting in Senghor, and that's how he goes beyond the concept of Antianity, or how he goes beyond Gilroy. Two ways. One, the, the limits of the modern teleology that I talked about in Gilroy's is, is also visible in most of Black studies, right? And in Senghor at, at, at moments, at some moments. 
But when Senghor becomes fundamentally uh, Africa-centered uh, and reads through Serer and Dogon, that's when you see this um, pluriversalism going on. Thank you. Um, so Kajitan Ieka asks, uh, he says, thank you for the excellent talk. Why do we need Gilroy when Senghor's work preceded the Black Atlantic? Uh, is there a risk of subordinating Africa with the notion of completion? So in reference to your, to, to your title. Right. Uh, Prof, I hope you're well. Uh, it's been a long time. Uh, and thanks, thanks for inviting me here. It's really, really a pleasure. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, why do we need, you know, uh, actually one of the things that I've been saying, and I think all the Francophonists here uh, have in, who have read Glisson uh, have at a certain point said, why are we reading the Black Atlantic? Just Glisson. 1969, uh, you have the impression that most of the, the concepts that um, uh, even the concept of the Atlantic, Gilroy's understanding of the Middle Passage as a fundamentally heterogeneous place, uh, the, the, the limits of the modern Targa and like most of the engagement that Gilroy, of Gilroy in the Black Atlantic are exactly the same in Grisson. Exactly the same is an exaggeration. But again, it took time for the Anglophone world to read the Francophone world. That's one thing. Uh, and two, but now, do we need Gilroy? Yes, I think we need Gilroy. Uh, Senghor's engagement is different from Gilroy, and there is a need uh, to put them in, in discussion, to get them to talk to each other. Uh, I think Gilroy's work is, is, is extremely interesting in the ways in which he, he engages uh, with the modern subject and um, uh, the, the pluriversality and the rootiness in the ways in which uh, the Black Atlantic, you know, um, I'm talking about the Black Atlantic, in the way in which he complexifies uh, the, 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 the um, constant reinvention of modernity uh, throughout the century. So there's, there's many things that, are, that I find interesting in, um, uh, in, in Gilroy. Uh, now, the question of completion, uh, like, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I, my, my, my grandmother used to say, when you're, when you're done, you die. <laughs> uh, and there is no uh, theory uh, that, is, um, that is complete. Uh, but but that, that reference was actually, it was a play on word because uh, Gilroy wrote a text, the critique of Du Bois called it an incomplete argument, that if Gilroy went all the way in his thinking, then his understanding of Blackness would have been different. And what I'm saying is Gilroy's engagement with heterogeneity of uh, the Blackness uh, and the limits of teleology and roots is interesting. And I think actually is, um, uh, is something that I that I really appreciate and that changes the direction of Africana studies and and and, and complexifies it. But what I also say is that I'm not I don't have a problem with what Bill Roy, Gilroy says. I have a problem with what he does not say. The insinuation, because his application of the question of of heterogeneity, uh, of the limits of roots, starts in the Atlantic. So it's the African, the the new 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 black, uh, new world blacks that are heterogeneous people. Uh, it's with modernity that heterogeneity or, or pluriversality for that matter starts in Gilroy. And if he went all the way uh, with his logic, then he would have seen the same in Africa and with Africans and understood that even the idea, that the idea of Africa itself cannot be linked to roots, but to movement and fluidity and Africans are Creole too, and have always been. If Creolity uh, is the engagement with um, uh, a, a, a different space that leads uh, to, 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 to another manifestation of oneself, then so are we. And um, uh, I actually argue uh, somewhere else that if you look at it, you know, and you don't just imagine Africa as something that happened before, but Africa as something that's constantly becoming. And if you understand that ancestors get born every day, 
then you would quickly realize that what um, people like Meme call Afropolitanism and whatnot are not new, they've always been here. That's, that's my argument. Um, our next question sort of moves in that direction, actually. So uh, Artin Aubry asks, uh, by rejecting linear history, um, don't we end up as well considering African conceptions of history as having not changed for a very long time, and in doing so, denying the capacity of African conceptions of history to change through experience? in that sense, appropriating linear conceptions of history as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, like the, the contrary of linear is not fixity. And is not what, um, uh, the, the, what was his name, Sarkozy called the circle when history never happens. Uh, the limits of theology is the possibility of one single movement that goes from point A to point B, and that's inscribed in progress in such a way that what happens before is less than, and what happens somewhere else, space and time we know are the same, is also less than. So it's this modern teleology and single history that implies, that is, that, that implies the possibility of hierarchy that is questionable. That movement happens, different manifestations of being happens. And Africa yesterday is not Africa today, will not be Africa tomorrow. But yesterday, to, today, and tomorrow are also inseparable in many instances. And that's where I'm getting at. And that's how African realities, uh, that's how we, sh that's, that's, that's the only possibility of engaging uh, with, with reality. So I'm not saying that this, I'm not, I'm not developing a theory of fixity. And I'm not either de de developing a theory of time as circular and we come back, you know, I know that that has been done in African studies, but here I'm saying that within the, mar the, the African ontology in other spaces, Senghor actually founds what he's saying on, on two ontologies, Wolof and Do. And he says that being is constantly unfolding. So Allah, one in, in Senghor has been recently read as somebody, oh, Senghor is just taking, and Suleiman Bashir Dai, uh, Donna Jones, uh, major scholars from uh, Senghor scholars have, have, have argued that Senghor is Bergsonian because his conception of time is that of Bergson, and conception of time as duration, not the time of the class, but the time when the subject participates in unfolding of being. But Senghor actually, Yes, theorizes duration, but his duration, he founds it on Sever and Dogon ontology. And that duration, as uh, the subjects being constantly unfolding in their diversity and universality, question past, present, future, the idea of time as snapshots, and offers possibilities of, diff of, of, of multiple manifestations of being that are not necessarily hierarchical. That's what I'm getting at. Thank you. And yeah, and that, I mean, that argument too is, I encourage everyone to read uh, Dr. Chem's first book, Return to the Kingdom of Childhood, which really uh, makes that argument in a compelling way. Um, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so if you've been holding on to your question, please feel free to enter it into the chat. Um, while we wait to see if anyone has more questions, I'll just ask, uh, uh, do you know what Gilroy's engagement with Senghor, if any, was? I, I know that he cites him like once or twice in the Black Atlantic, but only to talk about Anglophone. I think he, it's a, in the passage about Blyden where he wants to talk about, you know, other Anglophone thinkers. Um, and was that just a question of like, he didn't have access to, to Senghor's texts? I don't know. Does does he write? Does anybody know if he writes speaks French? Because if you don't speak French, you don't. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Uh, you have access to Senghor's one or two of Senghor's texts. You have access to Senghor's poetry, but you don't have access to, um, and you have access to Sartre. Right. And Senghor have, uh, and, and um, uh, what's his name? Irele. And that's how Negritude has been read through Sartre yeah. and Irele. 
but yeah, that's 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 an issue. But also another question that I keep asking myself is, does Gilroy have access to Greece Hall? Because it this is the weirdest thing: the Black Atlantic and Poetics of Relations. Uh, those books have a lot in common, even the idea of the of the of the boat. Yeah, the the yeah. Bar Yeah. yeah we, but, but yeah, that's that's a good question. You know, I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I think we can wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Chef, for such a great talk. Um, and thank you all for, for attending. Thank you also to Nora and Kristen um, for their help in organizing this, this webinar. Um, just a reminder that the webinar will also be available uh, recorded on the Yale African Studies website. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Doyle. And thank you. Uh, everybody uh, for for being here and thanks a lot for inviting me uh, it's been it's been a pleasure